Welcome to the Metaphysical Art Gallery. We're here visiting Ro Libretto in her studio. Hi, Ro. Hi, Katie. Thanks for having me back again. And hi, all you people out there in video land. Good to see yous or not see yous, but cool anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to see your latest work, Ro, and hear more about what it means. We're going to be joined here by Caitlin Padilla in about 15 minutes. And in the meantime, I just wanted to chat with you, Ro. All right. Um, let's see, what can I tell you? Before we get into my work, I want to make sure that everybody knows about the upcoming show at Tortuga Gallery. It's the Grief and Gratitude exhibit. And Katie, I think you have a piece in that, right? Yeah, I do. You I do. actually do. You do. And that show opens Friday, September 3rd. I can't remember what time, guys. Six o'clock. And Tortuga Gallery always has events that take place during the month of any exhibit. So if you can't get there for the reception, there's gonna be poetry readings and new live music and events like that happening during the month that will kind of support the exhibit and give you another excuse to go down there and check it all out. So uh, that's for the month of September. Tortuga Gallery is located at 901 Edith Boulevard. No, Edith or Pacific? Pacific, I think. <laughs> it's Can it's. Edith is the latest cross street. But... It's the cross street. Now we're both going to look it up because I yeah, should have looked it up before, it. I got on the, <laughs> before I got online and tried to tell everybody about something that wasn't true, right? And that's like sucks. All um, right. They're at, where's your address, Tortuga? Google they, have, it. they have kind of a funky website. I'm looking on their website. There it is, 901 there. Edith Boulevard Southeast. It is Edith Boulevard. Yeah. And you should um, check out their website, www.tortugagallery.org. It's an org website, not a com. And if you check out the website, you'll see what events are coming up in the month of September. So you can check those out too. Yeah, are you you're in that show too, right, Ro? No, I'm not. In you're that show. not in that show. What? Here's, here's a funny story that happened. Uh, Logan asked me if I would help jury, and there was a, a number of people who were on the jury to select the artwork. And when she asked me, she said, "Well, as a jurist, you're, you're you could put a piece in." And I was all excited because I had just finished Illuminated in the Current Self, and I thought that would be perfect for that show because it's all about acceptance. You know, we had just come out of COVID and that was a COVID piece for me. So I was going to put that in there, but I sold it. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> what a nice problem to have. Yes, that's a really nice problem to have. So, you know, I contacted her and I said, I don't really have anything that fits the theme. So I'm coming to the reception. I'm really glad to help you guys, Jury, but um, just, I ran out of stuff. So that was that. But uh, speaking of that piece, Illuminated, uh, if Caitlin doesn't mind us starting without her, I'm going to share my screen so that we can look at the folder that shows the three pieces that make up the series called um, The Theological Virtues. Yeah, so let's take a look. Go. Share screen. And this is what I want to share. Okay, now I'm going to close that down so that we're all not tripping over me. And we're going to start with the duality of hope. You probably remember that from months ago. Yeah. Right? The little fishes. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't done yet, though. Last yeah, time we remember. saw it. Yeah, probably. It's probably like midway with it. But I'm going to backtrack in case people are not familiar with how this series started, because you and I started discussing it at the beginning of the year. And um, as you know, I'm often influenced by the images that I see. I'll have a vision of something and then I'll feel the need to capture it, paint it up. Or sometimes it's a, a, a voice that says something to me. And in this particular case, it was I had been all jammed up during the COVID crisis and I wasn't able to paint. I think I made one painting that year and I woke up one morning and I could hear <laughs> this chant 
from going to Catholic school where they made us recite the catechism. And one of the questions was, what are the three theological virtues? And the answer to that is the three theological virtues are faith, hope, and charity. So that kept repeating itself to me over and over again. And I figured, well, it must be time to make a painting. <laughs> so I started the sketches. And the first one that I did was actually hope. And here you can see that hope is depicted as an anchor. And that's pretty common iconography in, uh, in at least Christian religions, it is. They think that um, the anchor represents that which is in your life that will keep you stable in times of trouble. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's used as a symbol for hope. And as I was working on this painting, I realized that that anchor could be what they say. It could be that which keeps you in place during times of trouble, or it could also sink you if you put your hopes in something and the thing that you put your hopes in doesn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out. So as you know, my work, I often use the koi fish to depict emotions. So here I have a koi fish rising up. That is the fish aspiring that his, his hopes will come true and things will work out. And then the fish that's being thrust into the turmoil of emotions, all these um, kind of tumultuous sea imagery here being thrust back down when you're, when your hopes don't come to fruition, we're often disappointed and we get flung back into that cycle where we become depressed and hopeless. And then we come back around and we hope for something good to happen and it doesn't happen. And then we become depressed again. So it's one of those wicked cycles. So what this painting asks us to do is to decide, <laughs> I want to say like to hope with a grain of salt, <laughs> you know, like you, you have to think about what the alternative will be. If what you hope for does not happen, what will you be able to do to counter the effects of it for yourself emotionally? Hmm. Right? Now here we have the, um, the higher self in the sky and the links to that that can keep us out of the water, right? So we can aspire to something. We can remember that there are this, if we turn to our higher self, that has often been our source of strength here. So that was the iconography for hope. Hope has two sides. It has an upside, it has a downside. And that's why that piece was called the duality of hope. Nice. So the next piece that I did in this series, oh, I thought I could click through, but it doesn't look like I can click. The next piece I did in this series, come on. This one's actually called Illuminated in the Current Self. There's a little spelling error in that file name. And this is the one <laughs> that I wanted to put in the Grief and Gratitude show. Yeah. It's beautiful. And it is. I like it. I like it. It really is. It, it glows. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to remember what the heck these plants are called now. Oh, no, I can't remember the name of these plants. <laughs> you anyway, got it last time, I think. I did. I, I yeah. can't keep it in my head. So these are a kind of plant that grow regardless of the, of the soil that they're kept in. Right. Now, this piece is supposed to represent faith. And no, yes, this is the faith one. I get faith and hope mixed up. So if you have faith naturally, you will be able to bloom no matter where you end up. It's kind of like a kind of optimism, right? You think things are going to work out for me. Everything's going to be fine. So no matter what kind of soil, whatever kind of situation you end up in, you're going to bloom. But there are people who are unable to have that kind of faith. So for them, <laughs> I say, Stand where you are now. If you look at the three moons here, stand where you are now. Look back at your life and see how strong you were in the past and how you were able to get through the things in your past to make you who you are now. And there is where your faith lies, because that's what's going to help you have faith to be able to get through to whatever happens in the future. Nice. Now, also in this picture, 
I have the snakes. The snakes represent, is that Katie? Is she here? It yeah. is, yes, hi. Hi, hi. I can't see you, but I can hear your voice. So here, the snakes represent the power, the Kundalini power. That is the secret strength that sits within us in the base of our spine. And it's like, it is the potential of ourselves, the potential of our souls to rise to greatness. So that's there, right? We just don't always recognize it. It's there in the past and it's there in the future. We just don't always see it. But if we accept the blessings, and this is the symbol for the blessings of the moon goddess, if we accept the blessings that are offered to us in our life, we can feed that potential and we can grow into our strongest, best self. So this one that has to do with faith is chock full of, like a lot of my stuff, is chock full of all these individual symbols. And um, of course, the individual icons are explained in the blog page on my website. So anyone is welcome to take those individual symbols and twist them into a story that means what they needed to mean for themselves. But this is the interpretation that I came up with based on what I saw. So that was the second of the trilogy. So it was um, Faith, Hope, and Charity. So charity is this guy. Wow. Now, this is not a very good photo of it because I took it in the backyard with the trees and the sun and everything was, the lighting's kind of messed up, but you get the idea. So we talked about, I think Caitlin was on the call the day I said, I have no idea what the hell this pelican means. I just don't yeah. get it. So I did a little bit more research. And I found out that it was, it was actually believed that if a baby pelican pecked at the adult, the adult pelican would peck it to death. <laughs> and then three days later, it would cut itself and bleed on the dead chick and the chick would come to life again. So Christian theosophers totally latched onto that ideal and began to use it as a symbol for Christ in the Christian religion. So it became, you know, I mean, Christ is said to have given the ultimate sacrifice. The ultimate act of love was to give his life for humanity. So um, Christian theosophists latched onto that idea and the pelican then became the symbol of Christ. And it's, I saw it like carvings over doorways and these, uh, religious reliefs that were put in churches. As I was doing my research, I found out all that stuff. Now there's obviously <laughs> Christianity doesn't have uh, the lock on what faith and what rather what charity is. It's really important to Buddhists and uh, in the Hindu faith, here we got the symbol of the Lotus. In the Hindu faith, they talk about all different kinds of love, all the kinds of loves they are, and they actually categorize them into more things than what I can possibly remember. But I do remember that, you know, there's brotherly love, there's romantic love, there's parental love, there's um, charitable love where you help out those who are less fortunate than you, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that we make sacrifices or we give up things to help others in all walks of life for all different things. What I'm questioning, what that came to mind with this piece and when I struggled with it for so many months was, where is that line? You know, when is charity, when does charity become enabling, right? You can help a person as much as you can help a person, but then you are not helping them, you're harming them. And the other aspect of that was if you continue to give of yourself, much like the, the Christ mythology where Christ gave his life for humanity, we as humans can't do that <laughs> because we got responsibilities in the here and now. You know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to give to a charity until I'm totally broke because then I can't help anybody, not even myself. Then I become the beggar on the street, right? So in this particular piece, I ask people to think about the ups and the downs of charity. See, the ups and downs. What is love? What is charity? What's acceptable? So I call the piece sustainable charity. And that's oh. what that one's about. That's so that's, awesome. that's the three pieces. That's those three pieces that make that up. The duality of hope illuminated in the current self 
and sustainable charity. Now I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Ah, close that <laughs> and come back. Hi, guys. All right. Hi. So Hi. that's what those are about. Do you have any thoughts on it? <laughs> yes. I think I, yeah. <laughs> well, come on, Caitlin, you're always full of questions. So I think there's a load of stuff in, in the three theological virtues. I'm sure we can explore together. I think I think it's and I, I missed your your description on the first one. Um, the duality of hope. Yeah. Yeah. The duality of hope. Um, and I believe you were working on the Pelican last time. Yes, we were. We were talking. So it's really neat to see it come to fruition and like this, this end. And that's, it's such an interesting, um, you know, issue to kind of really think about. Um, and I, there's a saying that, that I have that, that um, comes to mind in situations like this. And that's um, keeping others warm does not require you to set yourself on fire. <laughs> that's a good one. That's and a good one. Yeah. yeah. And so that really kind of reminded me and you're, you're so right. Like you can, and, and I think that people try to communicate that with like the whole, like how full is your cup analogy kind of thing. But I think that ultimately, you know, giving of yourself until you are broken and empty is not really helpful for anybody either. Um, and it's also interesting because I, I know people struggle with like the, the nature of charity and what does it still count if it makes me feel good to do something from, for somebody else or to help someone out? Or is that, am I only doing it to make myself feel good is like my act of charity just self masturbatory right, and right. you know that that kind of idea of that balance you know to be able to give in a meaningful productive way that does of course it it makes you feel good and have that humility stay with you enough so that you can see that balance and and not just wear yourself out too. So that's that's a really it's a it's a really neat topic to kind of think about. And I like how how you have that imagery and the you ultimate have, sacrifice, the imagery of the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. Right. And and it's a lot of your work is is about this balance of, of giving and receiving and being able to see from others' perspectives. And you a lot of your work seems to to incorporate those those different perspectives and being, you know, your willingness to be open to receiving. Because that's a huge thing too. You can say like, well, how come nobody's ever nice to me? <laughs> but then when people try to be nice to you, it's not in the exact way that that you were expecting or it's right. not Right. You're not necessarily open to the ways that they want to give to you. So being able to see things from another perspective and and invite those things in and be open to them when they when they happen is is also really good. Yeah, it's a good point. It's interesting. You make that you you made that statement about setting oneself on fire. As I was working on this piece, one of the things that came to mind was the. <laughs> When you're in an airplane and the airplane's going down, yeah, yeah. They say put the oxygen mask on you first, and mm -hmm. then uh, if you're with a child, to put it on the person that you're with. And I think that charity is like that too. If it's to be sustainable, if it's to be a healthy giving, it's um, you have to make sure that you are in a place where you yourself are taken care of, so you don't end up on the dole, and then. And, and we're not just talking financially. I mean, we're talking emotionally, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, right? yeah. Not to get yeah, yourself you worn to, out. You have to put the oxygen on yourself first. Because if, yeah. you, if you pass out, if you're dead, you're not helping anyone. <laughs> That's right. That's oh. how I think of it. So it was my intent when I made the three pieces to be able to show the three pieces together. But since I sold Illuminated in the current self, 
I'll never have them hanging in the same place at the same time. You know, it's the, so that was a little disheartening, but you know, that's the nature of our business. We well, you can, um, you can get a few prints, hang the prints. That's what I'm going to end up doing. That's, definitely. that's how you have to do. Yeah. I, I yeah. sold, I, I have a series of, of women who are, um, the elements, the goddesses of the four elements, earth, air, fire, water. Uh -huh. And I sold air and fire. And, and so, I, <laughs> so I have earth and water, which are wonderful, but it's just, it's hard when you break up a, a series a set. like that. Yeah. 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 I yeah. had it with this series on love. I did it, I don't know how many years ago. And it was originally three and then it grew out to five and they're hearts. And you may have seen them on my, no, maybe you wouldn't have seen them on my website. Anyway, there's five hearts in the series and they were all original watercolors, little tiny things. And I sold two out of the three, three out, three out of the set. So now I'm left with two. And it's when you hang them together, it's you feel like the story is missing. They're supposed to depict different kinds of love. So all I've got is like two kinds of love hanging out there. So I did. I made prints of everything so that people could, I could talk about it. Yeah, you can get the whole series. There. Yes, to have it yeah. all out there to be able to talk about it all at once. I love how you're able to talk about your work, Ro. I aspire to be like that. Like I, I, I really... Well, you also research your work. You research oh, yeah. the symbols and you learn yeah. about the history of symbolism and what these symbols have meant over the course of centuries. It's Which because I totally think it should be done. I, I applaud you and I think you do it the, the, the right way. I, the right I, way. Is there a right way? I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if I could I remember what I researched, it would be better. But I, <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, if you're going to incorporate <laughs> these heavy symbols, especially if you're, if you're pulling from different religious practices, I think that doing the giving it the respect and the honor of knowing what you're incorporating and the the um, the meanings of it makes makes a huge difference. Very nice. That's a word from our sponsor. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and now and now a word from our sponsor. There you go. My daughter sharpened a a blue colored pencil. There yeah. it is. Very, there it is. Very so, tiny. so when my pencils are that small, I take two short pencils and I tape them together so that you have points on each side, so they look like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Because they're too hard to hold when they're that tiny. They are. So I mean, she's together. got little. She's got little eight-year-old hands, so they're still. It still works for her, but not. <laughs> not for won't me. Work for no, me. No. So, on the, um, in line with the thoughts on researching a piece, you have to remember that when I create a work, it's because I see the imagery first. And I don't know where the imagery comes from. I don't know where the concept comes from. And I believe that the, the images appear to me to tell me something that I need to know or that somebody in my, in my it's circle of influence needs to know. So I paint the paintings and then I have to research them because I don't know what the hell they mean if I don't do the research. It's like, some, like somebody talking to you in a foreign language. I need some kind of a guidebook to decipher the things that they're telling me. So that's how come the research happens. And I wish to God that I actually could remember half the stuff that I research because some of it's pretty deep, which is probably why I do what I do. I write the little story and then I go back to my blog and I write a key and the key uh, delineates all the icons that are in a given piece and it gives a description of those icons. And then people can weave that into their own stories. But for me, who does not remember, <laughs> it helps because I go back and I go, okay, let's see. Well, the fish, I always know. Who doesn't know the fish, for God's sake? But sometimes there'll be a color flower. There'll be a, like in this painting, there's a red tulip and an orange tulip. Are they yellow tulips? No, they're red and orange tulips. So I know that they each mean something else. But if you ask me right now, I don't know. I have to go to the website and look it up. I don't remember what it was. Because yeah, like I'm on to the next thing already. I can't remember. Yeah, stuff, but. that happens. I have, I have a painting that I did a lot of research for and made sure that, you know, but, but again, I, I completely um, empathize with that because a lot of times like images and symbols will, you know, a, incorporate, appear. appear yeah and incorporate themselves and I have to incorporate it. And then like doing the research and figuring that out is, is the why, why 
did this appear and what significance does it have and why am I being called to paint it? There you go. Yeah. Of, well, that's us thing. as metaphysical painters. I think that the why is important to us. Right, exactly. And so I did this piece that has a bunch of mudras, which are Hindu yeah, hand I symbols. Know. Uh -huh. And I know in there, it's in there, what they all mean and in what, and then they're in a specific order and everything. But I swear I've had to look it up numerous Every time. times. Yeah. And I finally, I finally like derp moment. I finally like wrote it all down and have it in a word document. And so I have it. So you I can find them thing. the next time. Yeah. yeah. So I can, and I labeled it. And so I'm like, okay, now, now I know. I got one of those for flowers. I have one of those for flowers because there's so many kinds of flowers. And there's so many colors. And darn, I still don't remember the name of that flower. But okay. <laughs> All right. So moving on. Because let's see. It must be about 730. I don't want to keep people too late. It's it's getting close on it. But, did you know, you're interesting. So we can talk forever. Oh, that's sweet. Thanks. So the other thing I wanted to touch on is the pain in the ass piece that I'm working on right now. And I'm going to show you why it's a pain in the ass. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you a couple of videos that are that are speedy videos. It's like, let's see, share screen, that one, this one, this one. I'm getting better at the sharing thing. <laughs> All right. Now, studio visit. Okay. You may have seen this video on Facebook. And here what I'm doing is I've cut a piece of paper that it's about 80 inches long and two feet wide. And I have to wash the sizing out of it. Because with my technique, I have to be able to stain the paper with the watercolor. Watercolor normally has a sizing on it and that allows watercolor paint painters to erase their mistakes or create a number of different effects but it's in the way when I have to do it. So the first thing I had to do was take this giant piece of paper and do that. Then I had, and I didn't show this video. Then I have to stretch it. So what I've done is I, cause I needed a flat surface. I took one of my hollow core door panels and I laid it out and you see me stapling like a mad woman. I stapled the thing down. Now, what happens because it's a cotton rag paper, when it dries, it shrinks. And as much work as I put into doing that, uh, as much work as I put into doing that, when I finished it, <laughs> it shrunk and it tore and I had to restretch it. But we're not going to talk about that. That's oh. just one. Of the, right? <laughs> <laughs> actually stretched it three times. Oh, wow. <laughs> and in a, in a little while, I'll show you how, how it ended up. But okay, so here's a picture that shows you. Here's the sketch that I started with. And what I had to do in order to get it this big, of course, was blow it up in sections because I have a my copy machine only handles eight and a half by 11 paper. So I had to blow it up in sections and transfer it onto the watercolor paper that was stretched. You see how it's taped down the paper? It's taped down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then once I got it all in position, I put graphite paper under it so I could transfer it onto the watercolor paper. And y'all know what graphite paper is, right? Yeah. It's kind of waxy on one side, has graphite on the other, and you slip it underneath. And so you draw this line, you trace yeah. over this line, it transfers it to the paper. And I'm saying that for people who don't know what it is, because I'm sure that there's lots of people who see. So here's my original drawing was only this big. And my first set of blow ups was this big. And then we came and we did this one. So I'm going to stop sharing now. So the interesting thing about that, that does sound piece, like a pain in the ass. So I'm, <laughs> it's I'm a pain sorry. in the ass. So no, but here's so here's how that occurred. It was like, all right, I really like painting on paper a lot, a lot more than what I like painting on panel. I like the look of it better when it's on paper. I like the way it feels. I like the intimacy of it being on paper. Um, so I said, how can I paint watercolor on a big ass piece of paper and still use my technique? And then 
be able to tote my paper around. So instead of having to carry a hollow cord door panel, 80 inches by three feet or whatever the they are carrying that big thing around. I wanted to be able to make a paper piece that I could roll, unroll at the gallery and hang with a bar at the top and the bottom. That's the end goal production wise. That's what I'd really like to be able to do with it. But <laughs> stretching the sucker and getting it to stay in place is a whole nother story in itself because you, you wet it, you stretch it, you finally get the sucker to stay down. And then when you have to paint a large section of that, that all starts to buckle again. So then you have to mm. wait for that large section to dry so it flattens itself out again. And then you go to the next section. You can paint the Do next section. Do you like section. torturing yourself, bro? I don't know what the hell is the matter with me. <laughs> I think there's something wrong with my brain. I, I wonder if there's an archival temporary sort of spray on glue you could use to, to adhere put it the, down and then take it yeah. back off again, right? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Maybe there's like a way that you could speed up that process too for waiting for it to to dry and like could you iron it? Well, ironing it affects the texture because it's a rough pressed paper and for the final coat, you know how I put the brown on top and yeah. it goes into little crevices. If you iron it, it flattens that sucker out. So you don't Even have Even if that you were texture. like to put put like a towel a cloth on top of it and yeah. try it. Yeah. That's that's up there. That's up there when I go to the final stage. I'm thinking I'm gonna have to do that. Because the final stage, the whole darn thing gets soaked, you know, with the hose yeah. and I write it down. But I'm gonna get up and try to show you guys how far I got so far. Ooh. Let's see if I can do this. It's making, it's making me frustrated just thinking about just it. Just thinking of yeah, my boyfriend goes crazy. I don't even know that I can show you this because it's so damn big. I'm gonna unplug this. And see if I can aim this at it. Wow. Yeah, it's big. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. It's seven feet? It's uh, 78 inches. So that's the top. Let's see if I can get to the bottom of it. Can you see the bottom? Not all yet. All the way down on the floor. It's all the way down. Go to your left. Floor? There we go. That's it, right? Well, yeah. And then it goes all, all the way up. This is like creative videoing, creative zoom, <laughs> creative zoom somethings, whatever these things are. There you go. So it's pretty effing big, right? Pretty. Yeah, darn, it's pretty big. Yeah. big. It's pretty big. And then when you get into, all right, so now I want to do these colorings in the sky. You see all the colorings in the sky, right? Those yeah. are large areas of wash, which cause the paper to buckle again. Yeah. So I'm working on it. I'll figure it out because hmm. that's kind of what I do is figure shit out. But, but man, the... you're not making it easy. <laughs> no, I don't make it easy my whole life. If you ever saw my if you ever saw my natal chart, you'd be like, oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It is in my nature to make things harder than what they have to be, I think. Yeah, right. that's, that's humanity. That's humanity, right? It could be easier, but it's not. So oh, the yeah. the thing about this particular image is that it was inspired by my little friend, Morgan. I don't know if you all know, my boyfriend, Jonathan, has a daughter who's now going to be 12 in November, I think. She'll be 12 years old. And she liked a painting that I did called Manifesting. And that's the picture that has the hand with the magic wand in it. And the wand is creating butterflies out of the flowers that are in the ground. And she said to me, I think you should make a painting that has the two hands making a heart. How do you make the heart like that? Is that the heart? Mm -hmm. Kind of? Yeah. yeah. However you do it that way, that way. See, I can't even do it with my hands. Then I do it with a painting. Exactly. Okay. So she wanted the two figures the, making the heart. So I said, well, if I'm going to take Morgan's concept, I have Morgan in it. So at the bottom of the painting, you saw the little figure of a person with long hair. That's Morgan oh. with, with a magic skirt on looking like kind of a, a shaman doing her thing. So she's oh, putting so her cool. she's putting her love out into the world. And that's what that is. So she's psyched. She stands in the doorway and, and tries not to talk. And she watches and she watches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cute. But I'm like, get the hell out of here. I can't work with you staring at me. Go, go someplace else. Yeah. I don't do life painting. Go someplace else and do that kind of stuff. So, 
So that's the one that's giving me the most grief right now. That's the one that I'm working on. Oh man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. I'll have to find an easier way to do what I want to do. I think after I finish this big one, I'm going to go back to table size pieces just because I need a break. Well, we're going to do this again in 12 weeks. So okay. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes about. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Um, I guess Caitlin went off to do mommy things. Bye, Caitlin. <laughs> and bye, Katie. I'll see you in 12 weeks. And don't forget the Grief and Gratitude Show at Tortuga Gallery, September 3rd. It opens September 3rd. Okay. I'll, I'll see you guys in 12 weeks. All right. Thank you. All Ro. right. Bye. Bye, Ro. Thank you. Bye.